Hi everyone. In this chapter we will be studying relations and functions. In this lesson we will be looking at the properties of linear relations. All right, now we're going to take this the, the next natural step here. We're going to look at linear relations. So by definition, a linear relation is one in which the exponents on the independent and the dependent variable are both 1. Okay, so the exponents, basically we're saying it has a degree of 1. Okay, that's the kind of polynomial we're, we're looking at here, if you want to think of it like that. Now, there are a bunch of different ways that these things can be written. y equals mx plus b, y minus y sub 1. Now, this when, it, when 1 is a subscript, when any time a number is a subscript, it's part of the labeling. Okay, it's not like this is y times 1 or something like this. This isn't a, an operation, it's just a labeling. This is like the first y over here, the first x. Or it can be ax plus by plus c equals 0, or we can move the c over ax plus by equals c. Now, these are all different sorts of linear relations that we're going to look at. And we're going to look at the properties. Okay? We call mb, x1, y1, a, b, and c are all called parameters. Okay? While x and y are the independent and dependent variables. So in order for you to understand or to, to get a specific um, linear relation out of this, what you need to do is you need the parameters uh, and uh, I should say it like this, you need the parameters values in order to, to get an understanding of, of what the specific linear relation is that you're looking at you need to know the values of these these parameters here. But x and y are your independent and dependent variables they're, they're the coordinates of the points that we're going to be analyzing. And so you need those guys to stay as x and y because they can represent anything. And we're going to be interested in how the y coordinate depends on the x coordinate and so on and so forth. So, so yeah. Anyway, I tell you what, I'm going to give you guys uh, even some names here uh, right now. This is going to be our slope intercept form. Okay, slope intercept form. This right here is going to be called our point slope form. Okay, point slope, oh, that's my favorite one right there. Uh, now, we've got general and standard form here. I believe this is, now I'm, I might be wrong in this because it depends on who you talk to. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you go online, for example, you start looking stuff up like this, and when it comes to the, the labeling, the naming, uh, there's very little consistency. I, I wish there was more, but uh, for us, I believe we might call this the general form, we we'll call this the standard form. We might flip that, but anyway. Now let's take a quick look here at some uh, properties here. So the graph of a linear function is a straight line, okay? As soon as you can look at a, at a relation and you notice that it's, it's got a degree of 1, right? The y coordinate has an exponent of 1, sorry, the y variable has an exponent of 1, the x variable has an exponent of 1. Linear, it's going to be a straight line. Now, and since only a vertical line is not a function, we're typically going to refer to these as all linear functions. Basically, that the the vertical line is the only line that isn't that isn't a function. So we can just use the expression linear functions kind of to to hold in general, understanding that that's a specific uh, a specific instance where it isn't. What's one of the interesting properties about uh, linear functions is that they have a constant rate of change. Okay, so when you take your y, your x coordinates, remember these are the values of the independent variable. If you increase these by by some amount, and you're, you're constant with it, so like here, plus one, plus one, plus one. If this is a linear function, one of the properties of that is that the the y coordinate, the value of the dependent variable, will also increase by a set amount. Now they could be different, they could be the same, but that's that's not the point here. The point is that. As long as you go up by the same amount every time along the, the independent variable, the dependent variable should increase by the same amount. <coughs> or could, it could very well decrease, okay? You could be, for example, going plus one, plus one, plus one, and this would be minus two, minus two, minus two, and that would be okay as well, just so long as it's a constant amount. And that's what defines a linear function. And so here's a great example, and it's the one that's, that's illustrated here. You got the point one zero two two. We got here three four, and there's our linear function. You can connect those with a, a straight line, and that line implies that it that this function can be applied to all the inf infinite number of points, okay, along the uh, the x-axis along the number line. 
and that we'll, we'll get a, a Y coordinate for every single one of those. Now, to determine if a table represents a linear function, and, or not simply to make sure that the X values and the Y values are increasing, or sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. <laughs> Makes more, that sentence makes more sense when you read it properly. To determine if a table represents a linear function or not, comma, simply make sure that the x values and the y values are increasing and decreasing by a consistent amount. Okay, if you start multiplying by some value, so let's say you're going up by one, like one plus one plus one, then all of a sudden it's multiplied by two, multiplied by two, multiplied by two. There's nothing wrong with that, and that might be a function, but it's no longer, like it says here, it's no longer a linear function. It's something else, okay? Now, let's take a look at some examples. Okay, so here's our example. Let's read what it says. It says, which of the following tables represents a linear function? Justify your answer. Okay, so let's take a quick look at this one. Uh, we've got our independent variable, our dependent variable. We'll just draw the line here to make that clear. Uh, notice that we're going up by 20, up by 20, up by 20, up by 20. So we add 20, add 20, and so on. Now, what are we doing here? Well, to go from 1 to 2, we added 1. That's easy. To go from 2 to 4, we added 2. Okay, so that doesn't, this is not linear because those should be the same. Now, actually, when you look at it again here, you notice this multiplying by 2. Multiply by 2, multiply by 2, multiply by 2. So this is not linear because this should be the same. It should be the same addition every time. In fact, I don't really even need to know what they actually goes up by to know that it's not linear. As, long, as soon as this ceases to be consistent in terms of addition, not linear. Over here, let's take a look at this one. Actually, let's, let's zoom in a bit here. So here we go. Uh, what do we got here? Adding 60, adding 60, adding 60. So that's consistent. And what do we got here? We're adding three, adding three, adding three. That's all good. So yes, this is linear. That's what we wanted. Uh, over here, we've got uh, zero. We're we gonna add five, add five, add five, add five. That's all good. Uh, here, okay, what did we add here? Well, to go from 32 to 41, we added nine. 41 to 50, we added nine added nine, so yeah. So that is going to be linear as well. Okay, good, over here, again, we'll make that a nice clear table of values. Oh, again, we're adding five, adding five, that's good. Uh, here, what are we doing? We're, we added 75, whoa, okay, well that's, we did not add 75 there, we added 125 there. Woo, and here we added 375, so yeah, this is not linear because that these are not consistent, um, uh, consistent changes in that variable there. Every one of these had a consistent change in the x coordinate, but the y coordinate or the dependent variable uh, for the first one and the last one didn't, so they're not linear. All right, for this next example, uh, what we're being encouraged to do is to use your calculator to identify whether or not these are, are linear functions. Now, when I take a quick look at this one right here, uh, y is equal to negative 3x plus 25. I, notice that the exponent on the y is 1, the exponent on the x is 1. So I'm going to assume right off the bat that this is linear. Okay, but now I'm going to go to my calculator. I'm just going to verify that. So I will press y equals, okay, to access the calculator's list of, of y variables. And I'm just going to enter that in, negative 3x plus 25. Now, because the negative sign is showing up in front of the function, I have to use the negative symbol not the subtraction, so minus, or negative, I should say, 3x. Uh, the x that I want to use, I've, I've watched a lot of students try to use the alpha x there, and that works, but right here, this button right there is your variable button when you're in your graphing mode, so x, and we'll add plus 25. And now when I graph that, oh, okay, there we go. So it must have been, it must have been quite a ways up here, so it's coming down like this. But that is linear. If you look at that, that is a straight line. I could adjust my window settings to, to see more of that, but that looks good. The next one. The exponent on the y is 1. That's good. The exponent on the x is 2. Well, that makes this a degree 2. That means this is not linear. Whoops. Not linear. Now I'm going to go to my calculator and verify that. We'll, again, we'll go to y equals. 
I will clear that last graph there and make this 2x, here we go, right there, x, and then squared, our square button is right there, so 2x squared plus 5. Then we'll press graph. Well, okay, well that's not linear. I can see it because it's got this little curve to it, so that's not linear. Okay, good. Next, y equals 5. Now, this is so interesting. There's no x here, okay? There's no x in this. There's, there's no dependence here on that variable. y is 5. It's constantly 5 here, okay? Now, y is to the exponent 1. Now, let's take a quick look at this. Let's go back to our calculator, y equals, okay? So I'm going to clear that one there, and I'll just put a 5 there, y equals 5. What on earth does that look like? Okay, well, there you go. That, actually, that makes sense. Now you think about it. What this means is that for every point I can come up with, no matter what the x value is, the y value is just going to be 5. That's a straight line. This is linear. Okay? It's a horizontal line, specifically. And now that's going to be confusing for some people because you're automatically going to associate the y coordinate with something vertical. But really what we're doing here is we're stating the, the property of this graph that stays the same. And so its vertical component is constant all the way through. So that's why it's a, it's a horizontal line here. Now, let's go over here. x equals 1. Um, again, there's no y here. There's no dependence on y. I'm not entirely sure what that looks like. So I'll, cl uh, sorry, I'll go back to y equals. We'll clear this. Now I want to put x equals 1. Now, well, I can't do that here. That actually doesn't make any sense here at all because this is all y equals, y equals, y equals. Now, it turns out that's because this is a different sort of beast altogether here. Be the degree here is still 1. This is, in fact, linear, but this is the one that's not a function. And I'll show you how you look at it in just a second here. So in order to, to dr see this, this line here, you can do it. Okay? Here we are in our graph. What I'm going to do here is I'll press second program to get into the draw menu, and I'm going to draw a vertical line here. And then I'm just going to move this, this cursor until I get over the point that I want. Now in this case, I want it to be x, e x equals 1. Now I can't get that exactly the way I want it. Maybe if I press 1, whoops. <laughs> Sorry, that did not do what I wanted it to do. That's okay. Vertical line there. We're just going to get that as close to 1 as possible. And so there's our, there's our vertical line. Okay, uh, right there. That is not a function, which is why you can't write it as y equals. Uh, and it turns out y does not depend on x here. Uh, x is just a constant value of 1 going up and down. So linear, not a function. Calculator has a little bit of a difficult time with that one. We're now going to use this example to help us explore the idea of a rate of change, or what we're going to in the future call slope. All right, now we're going to apply the idea of a linear function to some word problems here. So first one we read here is the cost for a car rental is $60 plus $20 for every 100 kilometers driven, okay? And then the independent variable is going to be the, the distance driven and the dependent variable is the cost. Now, and actually that makes perfect sense because you'll have control over how far you drive and then the, the result is going to be the, the cost, how much you're going to have to pay for that. And so here's a, a formula that kind of gives our relationship or an equation, I should say, or a function. Actually, it's not an, not an equation because uh, there's nothing to solve for here. C, the cost, is now 0.2 times the distance. And then what we've done with that is we had $20, $20 for every 100 kilometers, right? Now, we just reduce this to a unit cost, and that's going to end up being, okay, basically 20 cents per kilometer. That's all we've done. We've just reduced this to a unit, a unit ch uh, change there in, in cost. Now, plus the 60, because you're going to pay that 60 regardless of how far you drive. You drive zero, that goes away. You're still going to pay 60 just for, for your, maybe sticking your butt in that car. So anyway, so there's, there's our relationship here. If you wanted to write that in function notation, you might write that the cost is a function of the distance, and that would be 0.2d plus 60. Okay, just to be consistent with what we've been doing the last few days. Now, let's take a quick look here. It says here that for all linear functions, a constant change in the independent variable results in a constant change in the dependent variable. 
So this is how you can determine if the relation is linear or not from this kind of data here. So if we were to plug this into a table of values, let's zoom in here. Okay, so here's our distance. If we add 100, add 100, add 100, add 100, okay, let's see what it does. If we plug those numbers in, at zero kilometers, it still costs us 60. Uh, but if you take 100 and plug that in there, 100 times 0.2 is 20, plus that 60 is, is 80. So that went up by 20. If you plug the 200 in there, okay, that's going to be 0.4, or sorry, 40 plus 60, and that's another 20. And so yeah, this is going up by 20 as well. So we can tell that this relationship here is linear. Okay, because a constant change in the independent variable results in a constant change in the dependent variable. Now, we can graph this information by sliding over here, remembering that the, sorry, the, the dependent variable is represented on the y-axis. The depend, independent variable, blech, okay, sorry, I, I should have done that the other way. I should have started with the independent variable and then gone to dependent variable, but the independent variable is on the x-axis, okay? And there's our, our distance here. So now what we're going to do is we come over here and we convert these, these uh, rows on the table of values into a set of points here and we plot them. So 0, 060 goes right there, uh, 100 goes to 80, 200 uh, to 100, uh, what do we got here, 300 to 120, and then 400 out to 140. Now, there's going to be an awful lot of points on here because you're going to, the, the amount that you drive directly affects the cost here. Now, some people are going to ask uh, about, you know, well, is this discrete, is this continuous? Is this maybe one of those discontinuous graphs here? What we're going to do is we're going to draw this. We're going to connect all the dots here. The reason we're going to do that is because to, to really get this accurately, you'd have to draw in a whole bunch of little dots here. You'd have to draw hundreds and hundreds of little dots here to make that make sense for every kilometer or every even partial point of a kilometer here. When they calculate their price, they're going to round to the nearest cent, no matter how far you drive. But there'd be all these dots along here. So instead of doing that, we're just going to draw a straight line through this. Get, recognize that this isn't exactly continuous. Uh, distance is continuous. Okay, but the amount of money that you're going to get charged here isn't. Okay, it's going to come in discrete little lumps with the smallest value being a penny here. But we're just going to draw a straight line through that just, just to indicate the kind of the trend in the data here. And notice that every time we increased by uh by 100, it went up 20. So I added 100, I added 20. Added 100, added 20. Added 100, added 20, and so on. Now, that little ratio there as we're going up here, you know, 100 this way, 20 this way, that's got a, a kind of a special meaning for us here. We can use each representation above to calculate the rate of change, okay? So the rate of change can be expressed as a fraction here. It's going to be the change in the de dependent variable over the change in the independent variable. So in this case, we had a $20 change in cost over a 100 kilometer change in the distance there, which gave us this, this rate of change, uh, 20 cents per kilometer. Another way to look at it here is this, uh, this rate of change here might be considered rise over run. Now the word that we usually use here, and there's a a couple letters missing here. We typically call this the slope, okay, of a line segment. It's the rise over the run, okay? This is the, the, and actually here we go. Oh, this, this should here, should say rate of change here will be change in Y over change in X. They're all the same ideas. Now, this idea of a slope in particular being the change in Y over the change in X, and, and we might use the symbol delta y over delta x. Now the little triangle there is a Greek symbol delta and it, it refers to change in. Now this right here is, is an extremely important concept in mathematics. Um, and this is, this, is, this is huge. When you get to calculus, most of the calculus is about this idea right here. Okay, and calculus tends to have this kind of aura about it being a really, really difficult, challenging branch of mathematics. And it can be. I don't deny that. It can be challenging. But at its heart, this is all it is, is this calculation of slope. Understanding how, how one variable alters when you alter another variable. Big, big idea. So now here, 
the rate of change that we got here was was 20 cents per kilometer okay so that's why every okay we interpret that as every increase in one kilometer is going to cost us 20 cents here so a couple of things notice that when that happens you you've got a sorry when you've got a positive rate of change here 20 cents here that means this thing is increasing 20 cents every time we go over um, one kilometer so that's a positive rate of change when the graph increases and and notice what's happened here because we've now zoomed in on this thing we can be a little bit more specific with our dots here I, I still wouldn't do it like this if you still had like if you were drawing 10 or more dots there uh, let's just draw a line through that to get the idea here okay but this means a positive rate of change when your slope is positive that means we're going up now remember that slope is the is the rise over the run it's the change in y over the change in x slope is change in y over change in x but we always assume delta x is positive delta x positive there are there are situations where you will look at delta x as being negative like you'll you'll actually interpret things going backwards but that's only in exceptional circumstances for the most part we're always going to assume that delta x is going this way every time we make a change in x we're going to increase the value of x and then we look at what happens to the y if there's a if there's a an increase in y it's because there's been a positive change compare that to this right here if we're still looking at now again i may connect those dots there if we're still looking at a change in x here, starting here and moving over, what has happened then is as I moved over this way, as my x value increased, I was curious what happened to y, and my y value decreased. So here we're getting this, this negative change in y. So here my slope is negative, negative rate of change dropping. So this is something right now that you need to take away from this, this example here, okay? Uh, Specifically, the whole point of this particular example was to introduce this idea of slope and whatnot. And right away, understand that this is positive slope. This is negative slope. Okay? Good. Okay, so now we've had a little bit of exposure to, to word problems and, and to this idea of a slope. And we're going to keep coming back to slope here. But now let's just take a look at this question. It says, write an equation for each of the following and identify if it's linear or not. Okay, so a new car is purchased for $24,000. Every year the value of the car decreases by 15%. The value is related to time here. So, okay, so we're going to come up with a, an equation for the value of the car here. So value, V will be value, let's say time. And it says every year. So let's say time, uh, time in years. So let's see what's going on. Value is, okay. Now, we sh we're gonna start at 24,000, okay? 24,000. Now, we are losing 15% every year. Let's just think about how that works here. If you're gonna calculate the percentage of something, you're going to multiply it by, by the percentage here. Now, we are, decreasing by 15%. So let's think about this. We're losing 15%, so how much of the value of the car are, are, did we keep? Um, well, we started at 100%, we lose 15%. That means at the end of that year, we've still got, we've kept 85% of the value of the car, but we've lost 15 So. At the end of the first year, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by 0.85, okay? Now, I'm going to end up multiplying this by 0.85 every year, okay? So, like, in year two, I would multiply by two 0.85s. In year three, I'd multiply with, okay, so I think now I can see what's going on here. This is going to be to the power of n. Oh, sorry, not the power of n. Sorry, I used, I used t. I've already used t here, so to the power of t. So initially, before we even start, t would be 0, and 0.85 to the power of t would just be 1, and so you'd be left with 24,000. When t is 1, I'm going to multiply that by 0.85. When t is 2, after 2 years, I would multiply it by 0.85 again. Okay, and that's going to go lower and lower and lower. Now, wow, this is not linear because 
like this has got something really crazy going on. The, ex the variable here is actually up in the exponent. And so when that happens, this is actually called exponential. Okay, so this is, this is even more complicated. It's not like a function that's squared or cubed or whatever. It's to the power of that independent variable. So that's an interesting one here. Okay, and, and sort of difficult if you've not had much exposure to equations like that or to, I should say, functions like that. Uh, maybe not obvious that that's what's going on here. Let's take a look at B. For a service call, an electrician charges $75 flat rate fee. Okay, okay. So that means he shows up at the house, he, he's there, he's going to charge you 75 bucks even before he walks in the door. And then it's going to be $50 for each hour he works. So the total cost is related to time here. So we're going to have C, we're going to call that cost, and we're going to let time, it's T be time in hours because that's, that's how his rate works. So what's this going to be? He's going to charge us, well, we're, first of all, we're going to get $75 right off the bat, plus, okay, we're going to, sorry, we're not going to get 75, we're going to have to pay 75 bucks. And then for every hour, for every T, it's going to be an additional 50, so 50 times time, because if, if he's there for two hours, it's going to be two times 50, if he's there for three hours, three times 50. And so there we go. This one right here, notice the, the exponent on C is one, and the exponent on T is one, this is linear. Okay, this is a linear function that first one wasn't. In this next example, we're going to look at x and y intercepts. Okay, so here's an interesting question. What we're going to do here is we're going to come up with another way of representing this linear function here. So we've got equations or, or functions here that we wrote out, just like in the previous one. We've got this little uh, function right here. Now what we're going to do is, based on some information, we're just going to draw a sketch of it. It's often really helpful to see things here. Now, we're going to start here with a y-intercept of, of negative 1 here. Now, at this particular moment in time, we haven't actually defined what that is. So what are we talking about here? Well, that's what, that's what this little bit down here is. So one definition we're going to look at here is the y-coordinate of the point where the graph intersects the y-axis is called the y-intercept or the vertical intercept. But we'll typically call it the y-intercept, okay? That, the significance of that point is that it's where the independent variable takes on a value of zero. So it's right here. Now that in, in many, many contexts, that is a significant number. Okay, when the independent variable goes to zero, we're really curious, well, what is the value of the dependent variable? Now, another point that's of, of interest to us is the x-coordinate of the point where the graph intersects the x-axis. We call that the x-intercept. Now, now, look at these here. You gotta look closely at the word here. It's not intersect, it's intercept. Okay, like an interception. Okay, it's where, they, where we intercept with those, with those uh, that even sounds goofy when I say it like that, but it's an x and y intercept here. And the x-intercept is where we cross the x-axis, the horizontal axis. And again, that's a significant one as well because what we're, what we're interested in is what's the value of x when we know that the dependent variable goes to y. Now, I'm going to let you know right now, finding the y-intercept is easy. Okay, finding the y-intercept can be very, very easy, just a matter of evaluating. But notice what goes on right here, and I'll zoom in on this one as well here. Notice what's going on right here. When the dependent variable goes to zero, okay, and I have to figure out what x is, this is about solving. As soon as you set the dependent variable equal to zero and you have to find x, you've created an equation that needs to be solved and finding the x-intercept, this can be hard. Now, for what we're going to see in, in Math 10 with linear functions, it really won't be. It will involve a couple of steps of algebra, but not very much. But as you move forward into math 20, math 30, and so on, you're going to find that, that these things can get increasingly more challenging, whereas the y-intercept really doesn't. The y-intercept remains basically the same. All you're going to do is plug in the value of 0 in for x and just see what you get. But anyway, so now we've got a couple of definitions here. We know what the x-intercept is and we know what the y-intercept is. Let's come back up here and we'll, we'll zoom in on this here a little bit. 
So we want to sketch a graph that has a y-intercept of negative 1, which means it's going to cross the y-axis here at negative 1. And it has a rate of change of 2 thirds. Now remember, the rate of change refers to the change in the y-coordinate over the change in the x-coordinate. So every time I move over horizontally 3, 1, 2, 3, there is a corresponding change in the y-coordinate of 2, 1, 2. 1, 2, 3 horizontally, 1, 2 vertically. Now, here's a situation here where I'm actually going to go backwards. We're going to talk about a, a negative change in, in uh, the x-coordinate here. Okay. So now, remember, this is still a positive slope here, positive 2 thirds, so it's going up here. But in order to get another point here, I would go backwards, 1, 2, 3, and if I go to the left, then I have to go down 2. So if I'm going to make, if this is still going to stay a positive rate of change, if I make the, the change in x negative, then I've got to make the change in y negative as well. And then again, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. Now, at this point, I would just connect the dots to create this straight line. Now I'm going to ask you something. How many points do I need to draw a straight line? And the answer is typically, if you're going to give it an academic answer, two. But that's not true practically speaking. Practically speaking, I need more points. I need to hit as many points as I can to get a nice straight line here because I'm going to do this by hand uh, and I really recommend you do. Don't worry about pulling out rulers and stuff like that. I put too much effort in. Just get a bunch of points and then connect them real quick. Uh, this next one says we got an x-intercept of 2, so we're going to hit the x-axis here when x is equal to 2. That's right here. The rate of change is negative 2. Now the rate of change, that should be a fraction. Okay, that should be a fraction. So to write negative 2 as a fraction, I would always write that as negative 2 over 1. And so now I can see quite clearly that there's a, for every horizontal change of 1, there's a vertical change of negative 2. Now negative meaning it's going to drop. So positive change of 1 horizontally, vertically I drop 2. 1 over, down 2. 1 over, down 2. And that gets me a few points here. Now I, I would like to have more points. So I'm going to force a small change in interpretation here. I'm going to make my, my change in x negative. And if I do that, then I'm going to force the change in y to be positive. So I'm going to go backwards 1, which is going to force me to go up 2. Backwards 1, up 2. Backwards 1, up 2. Now I got a bunch of points here, and then connecting the dots is a lot easier. Okay? Good. Nice linear function. Now, I've got a y-intercept of 3. Awesome. And an x-intercept of negative 4. Uh, okay, well, they only gave me two points. They didn't actually give me a rate of change here. But I can kind of interpret this on my own here. When I go over 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, my graph has gone up 3. 1, 2, 3. So I can give myself at least another point here, I think. If I go horizontally over 1, 2, 3, 4, and then come up 1, 2, 3. There's at least one other point here. Now, in this particular case here with this small number of points, and that I can't get around. Now I might want to yank out a ruler to help me get a better, better view of the, uh, the nature of that, that linear function there. Anyway, so remember, there's your y-intercept. It's the point at which we hit the y-axis. Here's my x-intercept, the point at which we hit the x-axis. Notice that I'm not giving them as terms of, of coordinates. When I ask you for the, the y-intercept, it, it is 3. It's not 0, 3, it's 3. When I ask you for the x-intercept, it's negative 4. Not negative 4, 0, although that is the correct point. But negative 4. Okay, I already know that the, the y coordinate should be 0. Okay, good. So now, let's think about where we're at right now. So now you know what slope is. So just recall real quick. We know slope. Okay, that's going to be uh, rise over run which is basically just change in y divided by change in x. Okay, so it's that ratio there. And, and take a look, everybody. The ratio here was 2 thirds. Okay, that's, that's fine. There's, it, that's a, a nice line in terms of slope. The ratio here was negative 2. Now, two, 
two, the value two here is larger than two thirds, notice that the line is steeper. Okay, so the larger the slope, or the larger the value of the slope, this becomes steeper. And then we've already defined the x and y intercepts as points where we cross the x and y axes. Okay, good. All right, so now in this example, we read here for each graph, identify the independent variable and the dependent variable. Uh, determine the rate of change of each linear function. Okay, well now rate of change, remember that's just slope. And describe what it represents, okay, because we've got a context here. So we have to figure out what that means in context. And then identify the x and the y intercepts and what they represent in context. Okay, so here we go. What do we got here? We got graph A. This is filling a water tank. Okay, so the independent variable is going to be represented on the, on the y-axis. Now, don't, don't just say L or, K or V. Don't give me that letter here. Tell me what it is. It's going to be volume. Okay, on the dependent, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Sorry. Here's your, your dependent. This is your independent. Oh boy. Wow. The independent variable here is time. And the dependent variable is volume. Okay. The rate of change is going to be how much the, the volume changes for a change in time here. So let's just pick a couple of, of points here. Let's start off with zero, zero, because that's a good one. And then the next one here that's really easy to read here, let's go grab um, 80 comma 4,000. Okay, so we went from, basically we had a change of, we had 4,000 minus zero over 80 minus zero. Okay, this, that's the difference here. So from our starting point to our end point, we went up 4,000 when we went over 80. So that's going to be 400 over 8. When we would divide that out, that would be 50. So our rate of change here is 50. Now, to give it a context, whoops, sorry, you can't see that. 50, to give it a bit of a context, look at the units here. Liters and minutes. Now, remember that this is, a, this is a fraction, okay? A rate of change is a, is a fraction. It's the rate, uh, it's the change in the y divided by the change in the, the x there. So this is going to be liters per minute. So this is the, basically this is the amount of time or this is uh, how much volume gets pumped in over time. This is the speed at which water is pumped in. Now, I, we don't have a lot of room to write that. The x-intercept here is zero, and the y-intercept here is zero. They both intersect at zero here. Now, what's happening here at the x-intercept here? Basically, what we're saying here is the initial volume is zero. That's uh, both of these together are saying the exact same thing. When time is zero, volume is zero. When volume is zero, time is zero. That's what these are suggesting here, okay? Now let's move on and take a look at the next one. This one's dropping down. Again, the independent variable, and this time I'll get it right to start off with, is going to be time. And once again, we're looking at volume for the dependent variable, okay? The rate of change. Now let's take a look at the rate of change here, and let's maybe pick a couple of points that are, that are easy to read. Uh, one point here is going to be the point zero six thousand, and then another point here is the point forty two thousand. Okay. Now let's just take a look at how did the y coordinate change. Well, let's see. We we typically want to read these things left to right, so I'm going to take the far right point here. So it had a volume of two thousand. I'm going to subtract the original at six thousand. That time, the time over here was 40 minus the original time was zero. So 2,000 minus 6,000 is going to be negative 4,000 over 40. And when we, when we cancel those things out there, it looks like we're going to be getting a number of negative 100. Now that's the value of that slope. Negative makes sense. It's dropping. I'm losing, I'm losing what? Well, I'm losing a hundred liters per minute. 
So this is the speed of the drain. That's how fast we're losing, we're losing water here. 100 liters per minute. Now in this case here, the x-intercept, if I'm reading this carefully, looks like we're going up by 20s, the x-intercept is 60 minutes. Now what's the significance of that? Well, this is the time to drain uh, the tank. Because remember, at 60 minutes, what's the volume going to be? What's the, remember, the volume is along the dependent, the dependent axis here. Well, the volume is going to be zero. So at 60 minutes, the volume is zero. Now, when time is zero, what's the volume? Where do I hit the, the y-axis here? Well, I hit it at 6,000. So 6,000 liters. Now, that's the amount of water in there. When time is zero, well, that's the initial volume. Okay, and there you go. And this is the sort of thing that we want you to be able to do. It's not enough just to get these numbers. You've got to know what they mean. Let's take another one here. This one here is filling a hot tub. Uh, actually, this is going to be very similar to the one that we just we did a couple seconds ago here. Again, time is the independent variable. Volume is the dependent variable. Uh, rate of change here. Let's, again, let's grab a couple points that are easy for us to read off here. And, and here's one. Zero, zero is easy to read. Uh, another one here is the point 40, comma, 800. So how much did I change? Well, I ended up at 800. Compare that to the starting point of zero. I ended up at a time of 40. Compare that to a starting point of zero. So 800 minus zero is 800. 40 minus zero is 40. And when I divide those, I am going to get uh, 50. Okay? Uh, no, wait a second. I can't believe I just did that. 20. <laughs> wow. Sorry, I, as, as soon as I was looking at that, I was, just, I was assuming that I was dividing that the other way around here. Uh, 20. Okay, 80 divided by 4 would be 20 here. So the rate of change here is going to be 20. Now, positive 20 because I've got an increase. Positive 20 liters per minute. So this is the speed um, of, of f filling the tank or the speed of the water going in. Our x-intercept is zero, and our y-intercept is zero. They're both zero. We're going through the origin. This is because the initial volume is zero. Basically, to start off with, the, the tank is empty here. So these two together are basically going together. When I say initial, I'm talking about the time being equal to zero, and the volume is zero. There's your dependent value equaling zero. Okay, there you go. Good question. A lot going on in this particular question. All right, so this question says that this graph shows the fuel consumption of a scooter with a full tank of gas at the beginning of a journey. Okay, so here we go. So here it is, uh, not a very big tank, eight liters, goes 200 kilometers, that's awesome. So what's the vertical or y-intercept? Where do I hit the y-axis here? Well, I hit it at the value eight, okay? Eight, and eight liters, okay? So, the, and this is full tank, we haven't driven anywhere, okay? Basically, we've gone zero kilometers. What's our horizontal intercept, our x-intercept? Well, boom, 200 kilometers, okay? So 200 is our x-intercept, 200 kilometers. And basically, what's the volume of the tank at that point? Well, it's zero. So this is the distance to empty the tank. Basically, that's, if you want to think about it, that is that is the range of the, well, okay, I use, use range, that's a, maybe an inappropriate word to use here, but that's how far that you can go on one tank of gas. Now, my domain, okay, this is a continuous graph here, okay, because distance and volume are both continuous here. My domain, though, it doesn't make sense to talk about anything less than zero or greater than 200, okay, because I'm only going to start measuring distance from a full tank, and then I'm going to stop once the vehicle stops. And so this is going to be the set of values from 0, and I'll use x here, out to 200, and that's when we stop. My range, and this is why I should, didn't want to use the word there before, well, my range, how far did I go? Well, I'm sorry, not how far did I go, that's, that's the domain there. Uh, how much gas did that take? Well, I went from 0 
or actually better stated, I went from eight all the way down to zero. Now, when you write that out though, you're gonna start at zero because it makes more sense to talk about the, the smaller value up to the larger value, but yeah, that's gonna be our range. Now, what's our rate of change? Well, first of all, I know that the rate of change is gonna be negative, and what I've done here is I've lost eight for an increase in 200, okay? Uh, I can divide those what, both by four and I will get negative two over 50 or negative one over 25. And so that's our rate of change. We're gonna lose, it's negative one over 25. So we uh, lose one liter per 25 kilometers and that's the significance of that particular rate of change. All right, now, so in this example, we read that, well, the question says, which graph has a rate of change of one-half, okay, and a vertical intercept of six? Okay, now, so here's our two graphs to look at here. Now, the thing to notice to start off with is that this is positive one-half, okay? Now, we always assume the denominator, which represents our run, is going to be positive, so that we're always moving to the right here. So then the trick is we're moving up one unit for every two that we go over here. And so it's, it's got to be this guy right here because this graph is moving down. So this would have a negative rate of change whereas this is going to have a positive rate of change. So it's got to be this one right here. But let's just verify that it actually is one over two. And so yep, from here to this point right here we're seeing up one over two. Now that's just one way of representing it. I mean we could easily have said up two over four however you want to write that rate of change, it's going to reduce down to this, okay? Uh, additionally, it's got to have a y-intercept of, of 6, and so we look at where it intersects the, uh, or intercepts with the, the y-axis here, and it is at the value of 6. That's totally the one that we were looking for. All right, now for this question, it says for each of the following, we're going to find the x-intercept by letting y equal 0, and the y-intercept by letting x equal 0. So what we're doing here is we're, I'm going to give you a bunch of relations, okay? Well, probably most of them will be functions here, but anyway, they could be relations. And what we're going to do is we're going to practice this idea of finding the x and y intercepts, but we're going to do this algebraically as opposed to graphically. Now, it turns out the, the approach is exactly the same. So if we want to get, for example, the y-intercept, what we got to do here is we're going to let x equal 0. And in this particular case, when we do that, we get that y is equal to 0. Therefore, 0 is the y-intercept. At the same time here, if I want to get the x-intercept, I'm going to let y equal 0. Let's figure out what x is. And x is equal to 0. I mean, this is a very, very easy function. And so therefore, 0 is the x-intercept. Okay? Now, that's a pretty straightforward graph here that if you take a look at this, what that says here is the x-coordinate is always equal to the y-coordinate. That turns out that's going to be along this line right here. Okay, that looks like this, where every x-coordinate and every y-coordinate are exactly the same. The negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, and so on. So, yeah, it crosses through at the origin right here. Let's take a look at b. Now, this one's going to have a little bit more involved here. So, to figure out my y-intercept, we're going to let uh, x equal 0. So, it's going to be 2 times 0 is equal to 1. Okay, so this is exactly like, by doing this, this is exactly like looking along the y-axis, okay? Because any point along the y-axis is going to have an x-coordinate of 0. So this is exactly what we're doing there. So 2 times 0 is 0, plus 1. So therefore, 1 is the y-intercept. Oops. Now, to get the x-intercept, a little bit more complicated. We're going to let the y equal 0. Yeah, it's a little bit more complicated here, uh, and it always is. Okay, finding the y-intercept is always just a matter of plugging in 0 for x and evaluating. Okay, it's just evaluating the expression. But solving for the x-intercept involves making y equal to 0, and then solving the resulting equation. See, here, the variable is already isolated. I don't have to solve for it. It's already there. Here, I'm going to have to solve for, for x. So I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides and then divide by 2, the coefficient from the x, and I get negative 1 half. So therefore, negative 1 half is the x-intercept. Now I'm going to run out of room here, but... Okay. Next. Over here, to find the y-intercept, 
We're going to let x equal 0, so y is going to equal 2 thirds times 0 minus 4. And then so when you evaluate that, y is equal to 4. So therefore, the y-intercept is 4. Now, you should probably have noticed something here. Would you look at that? Look at this. Something times x plus 1, the y-intercept was the 1. Something times x minus 4, that y-intercept was, whoops, sorry, negative 4. I'm going to make that negative 4 there. Huh, isn't it funny how it's always that number over there? You'd think there was a pattern to that. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, let's take a look at the x-intercept. We're going to make the y-coordinate equal to 0, so 2 thirds x minus 4. Bring the 4 over is equal to 2 thirds x. So now I'm going to multiply by 3 to get 12, then divide by 2 to get 6. And so therefore, 6 is the x-intercept. So therefore, that's what the three dots means, x-intercept. Oops, can't see that. All right, next. Down here, okay. A little bit more complicated when it's written in, um, I believe we call this general form here. Okay, but the, the procedure is exactly the same. In fact, it's a little bit easier to work with here. So to get the y-intercept, we're going to make x equal to 0. So 0 minus 3y plus 5 is equal to 0. Uh, bring the 5 over, so negative 3y is equal to negative 5. And when I divide by negative 3, I'm going to get 5 thirds. So therefore, okay, therefore, 5 thirds is the y-intercept. Now, notice, notice I'm not answering the question by simply saying y equals 5 thirds. Okay, if, if you haven't already kind of clued into what this is, this is a line. Okay, when I say y equals 5 thirds, that's a horizontal line. If I'm asking you for the y-intercept, although it's related to 5 thirds, y, to say y equals 5 thirds, th that's not quite correct because y equals 5 thirds is a, is a horizontal line. Just like you'll notice, I'm not leaving something like this up here where it says x equals 0 and saying, ah, the x-intercept is x equals 0. No, no, that's a vertical line. Okay, it is related to the x-intercept, but the x-intercept is just zero okay so you want to make sure that you're just you're answering the question properly now to find the x-intercept for this particular problem we're going to let y equal zero so x uh, whoops minus three times zero plus five is equal to zero so that actually becomes a really nice expression so x is equal to negative five so therefore negative five is the x-intercept now here all oh, right, this is an awesome one. And this is actually, this actually follows along beautifully with what I was just saying here. Okay, let's take a look at what this graph would look like. Y equals three. So what this is saying here is that no matter what point you pick on this relation here, the Y coordinate is three. Well, that's, that's gonna be a horizontal line. Okay, where does it hit the Y axis? Well, the Y intercept here is going to be three. However, because it's a horizontal line, it's actually never going to intersect the x-axis. So therefore, the x-intercept is not applicable. Okay? It's just not something that's going to happen. It's not going to hit the x-axis. Okay? So again, to state y equals 3, that's not the same as saying the y-intercept is 3. This is, this is a horizontal line, and you really should be comfortable with the difference between those two. Just like here, x equals negative 2. Let's take a quick look at what that looks like. This is saying that no matter what the value of the dependent variable, the independent variable can only ever be the one value, negative 2. And so that's going to be a vertical line like this. Now notice this is not a function, okay? Uh, because I can't write, I can't write a dependence of um, the, sorry, I can't write the y variable as dependent on the x variable because the de dependent variable here, the y, is irrelevant. Okay, so now in this particular case here, it's the y-intercept that's not applicable because it's, it's going to run parallel to the y-axis. It never will touch it. But the x-intercept is going to be negative 2. Okay, that's where it's going to cross the x-axis. So again, it's related to what you're seeing here. But if I was to ask what is the x-intercept and you wrote x equals negative 2, no, no, that's a, I'm asking you where does it cross the x-axis and you're telling me the equation of a vertical line. Okay, um, 
Yeah, you're, you're just you're you're not answering the question correctly. I might. It's kind of like me saying, you know, what's your favorite color, and you're saying I own a dog. Uh, no, no, r wrong answer to that question. So anyway, hope that helps. And uh, yeah, now let's take some time to work through the assignment.